Jakie będą jednak wyzwania stojące właśnie przed tymi startupami? Czym powinny na początku zajmować się szczególnie? Jaka będzie ich przyszłość? Buszujące w zbożu jednorożce, startupy i innowacje w systemie żywności. Taką dyskusję poprowadzi profesor Krzysztof Klincewicz z Instytutu Innowacji Odpowiedzialnych Społecznie, Wydział Zarządzania Uniwersytetu Warszawskiego. Serdecznie zapraszam. Good afternoon. This time we are going to switch to English. I would like to introduce our guests. Magdalena Kozłowska, representing Napiferin Biotech, one of the leading technological companies dealing with alternative sources of proteins. Well, Peter, you already know, but just in case, Peter Kruger, uh, president of AgriFoods Italia, the largest uh, agri-food startup association in, well, one of the key countries when it comes to agri-food markets, and Jan Kisielewski, head of foresight in the largest retail or convenience store network in Poland, 600, sorry, 6,000 stores no, altogether. More, more guests, right. how many now? Every it day. It changes every day. <laughs> and this is probably the moment when we can pause then. Now take it's nine seats. and a half. <laughs> And this is probably the moment when we can take our seats. Yes. <laughs> and we have slightly over 20 minutes to go through um, quite interesting perspectives that you will see here. Because we have a startupper, or, well, Magda will probably tell you that it's, it's more of a sort of a, a scale-up scale or very ma mature startup. You have a retailer and sometimes startups complain about retailers blocking the access to the market. So Jan will definitely have uh, to explain the perspective of, uh, of the other vertical and you have investor. So uh, Magda, let's start with your story. When we think about startups in agri-food sector, when you think about the story of Napiferin, which was founded in 2014, Right? Correct. And now you are already benefiting from investments from foreign venture capital companies and you already have MVP or quite established company. So what kind of challenges do you think startups in agri-food sphere are facing? What's sure. your story mm -hmm. and what, what could be the lessons learned for others? Thank you very much for this question. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I think that the first challenge for Napiferin Biotech, I'm the co-founder of this company, is that we are in agri-food sector. That's already challenging. Uh, let me also explain to you a bit more what, what we do, what is the goal of Napiferin Biotech. So we are a technology company. We developed a technology and have patents on that. Uh, we know how to extract proteins from rapeseed, which is also known as canola and as rzepak in, Pol uh, in Polish. Uh, we extract proteins and the proteins will uh, be used as food ingredients. Uh, for instance, in shakes, in protein bars, in um, um, plant-based uh, drinks. Uh, the challenge is that we are a technology company, uh, so in order to sell our technology, to commercialize our technology, First of all, the biggest challenge was how we want to sponsor our R&D activities. So the first challenge, of course, is, uh, okay, where to get finances from and how to convince investors early at the beginning when you have only an idea on a piece of paper, you don't have a proof of concept, you only have dreams and ambitions. So that was the first, first challenge that we faced. Um, we aimed to convince some investors. We also gathered uh, sponsorship from EU. And we were able to uh, rent um, a laboratory to hire people, personal, and finally to achieve proof of concept stage. The next challenge is, of course, is how you want to protect your IP, how you want to um, make sure that you fulfill all the regulatory uh, demands which are there for uh, novel food ingredients. And of course, you also need uh, finances for that. 
So um, to be honest, when you finish one financial round, you already need to think as a startupper about the second financial round. So that's a kind of a continuous process that, that is a big challenge. And um, another big challenge, of course, is that you want to commercialize the technology. That's our aim. Our business model is to license the technology. And that's why you need to talk to all the partners in the value chain um, around uh, Rapeseed. So starting from Rapeseed processors that process Rapeseed currently only to oil, uh, because we want to sell our technology to them. Then they keep on asking the questions, okay, but who will buy the product, the protein? So we also need to talk to distributors, we need to talk to food producers, and inform them, educate, and present uh, unique selling points of food ingredients. And we have quite a lot um, to show you. This is the product of our technology. It's a pure protein from rapeseed. It will be used as food ingredient. And the story needs to be built around the um, unique selling points of the product. No matter if you talk to the food producer or to the rapeseed processor, because in the end, Everybody needs to have a business case. So that's the challenge that we have. Uh, it's an exciting journey. And um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, be driving um, this story. So in a nutshell, these are the challenges. So, so Magda, if we try to summarize, first of all, never ending stories of chasing money, mm -hmm. then intellectual property in the world full of thieves and copycats. And the third one? It is you, you have to stay updated on the regulatory pathway that you need to follow uh, once you want to introduce a new food ingredient. And there are certain regulations. Um, uh, for instance, in Europe, you need to apply for so-called novel food ingredient status. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so the novel food ingredients. And also, I think the storytelling aspect, so the, the way of selling yourself and your product and trying to explain what, what type of benefits it brings. So, moving from the startup perspective to retail sector, Jan, what about uh, expectations and barriers when it comes to working with startups? First of all, I would add uh, one important stakeholder in the, on that list is a consumer, our customer, <laughs> that we have to know and to know what he expects uh, and why. Because without this, all the technology and all innovation is not useful. This is just a tool to help them. And we at Jabka, we have a simple mission to make our customers' life easier, which is now really important because as we observe how the world is changing, the majority of those innovations that you also mentioned during your presentation is not just the disruption of the traditional model, but that's the solution uh, for the challenges that we have, especially the climate change that will uh, be really interfering with all the parts of the, uh, of the production that we mentioned. The agriculture will change because of this, because of temperature, lack of water, and all those factors. Then, of course, the growing uh, cost of life that uh, is really important for our customers and make them uh, to, to choose smarter. And not often, uh, and often to choose ready solutions, not, not 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 to look only for ingredients, and to look for alternatives to the current solutions. And then the third thing is the technology, of course. And uh, we treat uh, startups as a part of the ecosystem uh, in which we search for innovations. Yeah? It's like when I was studying on the agricultural university uh, in Warsaw. One of the things that I remember, that the more complex the ecosystem is, the more resistant it is to, uh, to, to changing conditions, yes? If you would uh, compare this, as I, I, I believe that nature is the best teacher for us, uh, if we would compare this to the current situation of innovation, if we open for smaller uh, and creative companies like you, <laughs> we have a chance to have a, a wider start of the funnel. And at the end of the, of the funnel, we have a perfect product for our customers that will make their life easier, will serve their needs, nutritional needs that are changing. Of course, the challenge is that at the end, we have to know the customer, and we know that the customer is seeking for something which is ready to use, which is convenient, which is 
full of value and they understand why they have to choose it. Yeah? So that's our role uh, in, this, uh, in this ecosystem. Plus, what, what we are doing at the moment, we are not just a typical retailer, but we expanded our business to dietary catering, to e-grocery. So if we will find the right innovation, right ingredient, right product, we can serve it in different touch points for our customers, yes? But the biggest challenge is to find the solutions which are really convenient, which are scalable, because we are not looking for things which are niche and serving only chosen customers that they can aff that the, those groups of customers that they can afford uh, some uh, products, but we want to democratize the solutions, yes? So we want them to be available for the mass customer. And that's our mission, and, and we are seeking all the time for partners that will help us do this. Yeah? So, uh, trying to follow this up, uh, Jan, I understand that the customer is, is really in the first uh, place as, as the main sort of control point for the products, but exactly. w w what type of practical advice you would have for startups like Nappy Ferrin? So, you, you saw the powdered protein derived from canola. So what should happen in order to bring such a product to consumers through retail stores? They should speak to us, first of all, meet with us, and we will support them because what we have, apart of the fact that I believe that Jabka is still a startup, uh, but that, that's the other story because we still behave like a startup. But first of all, we, we can support them with our experience from nine and a half thousand stores currently with the customers, what they are seeking for, what they are purchasing. Uh, we have a never-ending research on our customers. Currently, we are preparing a new segmentation of customers that will be uh, sourced in, in, in different data sources. And we will ask them about the alternative proteins. We will ask them about the future of food. So. Probably, uh, you know, it's always that two people and two brains can bring more than, than just one. What we can bring is uh, it's our expertise, our knowledge of the customers, and the possibility that we can test the products in our stores. Yes, so, and I think it's a priceless uh, input from our side. But we also ex expect products that are well developed, that are safe, that meet our standards. Plus, we have an ESG obligation, we have an ESG strategy, so we expect the same standards from all, all our suppliers. Yes. Excellent. Peter, now uh, passing the tap to you. Uh, perspective of investor. What, what type of advice would you give to agri-food startups? Not just in Poland, but in general. And uh, what, what type of challenges you think uh, investors experience while working with startups? Well, I think <clears throat> we just uh, witnessed a very interesting representation uh, of what's going on. Um, first, Magdalena, you know, she, she listed her challenges. Uh, I, I don't remember them. Uh, IP, there was that, regulation, and then there was something before, I funding Finance. probably. Um, and then, you know, market, okay? <laughs> And I think it's interesting because in the backstage we were speaking, and first question I asked her, you know, what's the price point? And she, I won't tell her, I won't tell you what, you know, what she told me, but, you know, right price point, okay? And I think um, it's interesting that she didn't mention the market because she already solved the problem of the market. And I think, and that's the main problem. That's always the main problem. Now. Uh, in her case, probably it's, she, I think she was, you know, she wanted to say it, but it's not the consumer, her problem. Her problem is the producer to which she sells her ingredient, right? Um, but in the end, I think that most of the times we see some great startups, but the problem is that they haven't really figured out the customer problem, uh, which can be the consumer or, you know, you go by steps, it can be the producer or whoever. And, and if you don't figure out that from the beginning, it's really going to be very, very hard, okay? In their case, they have a very good, you know, value proposition for, for their customers, which, of course, are serving consumers. Um, I was mentioning in my presentation the case of, you know, Axel meat or, you know, cultivated meat or synthetic meat and so on, 
which has become a huge boogeyman, especially in the country where I come from, which is Italy, uh, you know, synthetic meat. But the truth is we're talking about nothing because actually it's a product which is very hard to bring to market currently with the current technologies, even at scale. Okay, even at scale. So what are we talking about? Uh, and yes, in the end, the big challenge is finding a value proposition that is capable of staying on the market, whoever your market is. Once you've solved that, then you can start having other problems like regulation, funding, and so on. And, and so my advice is, you know, and, and this is the problem that also as investors we always struggle with. Uh, we see some great technology, but the, the product uh, to market fit question hasn't been addressed. And that's what you have to really, really figure out. So tr trying to move the focus towards a vision of the future of agri-food startup sector in Poland and in Europe, uh, People were talking a lot about unicorns. Also today, Peter, in your presentation, you mentioned some figures for unicorns in this particular sector. So question to all of our panelists. What do you think are the chances that we are going to get a unicorn in agri-food sector in Poland in the near future? I don't know Poland, uh, but there are certainly or, there are there are in the agri-food sector currently there are already forty to fifty unicorns globally. Uh, I don't know the last number because, of course, there's been a bit of a downturn in valuations in in, in the venture capital market, so it probably went down a little bit. But there are there are already quite a lot uh, prospects in Poland. Poland is a huge agricultural producer food producer, so I expect any time you will see some big unicorns. I, mean, I don't know, you guys are probably technically a unicorn, right? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I believe in Poland and in Poles, so I'm sure that a unicorn will appear, but the best proof that it's possible is that 25 years ago, Rabka was a startup and founded by seven people, and today I spoke to the man who opened the first uh, Rabka store in Svarzend, and now we are a unicorn, that's no doubt. But uh, so I wish luck for for the others. But I believe that we are strong in agriculture, as as you mentioned. We are str becoming stronger and stronger in science. And I also believe that uh, something that we have in Poland, uh, from a geographical point of view, we have a moderate climate, which will also help us. Yes, because when we are looking at the at the global warmth probably Poland will be the best place to live in five to ten years. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm a bit reserved to the definition of unicorn. Um, I know from the past um, financing rounds, which were based on crazy high valuations on achieving certain milestones by the company, the milestones were not fulfilled, the valuation went down, uh, sometimes companies had to uh, announce bankruptcy. Um, Nappy Ferren, my company has ambitions to become a unicorn. We have, uh, for me, unicorn means that you solve a global process, you solve the process to global markets, your technology is scalable and can be implemented in any part of the world. And in fact, Nappy Ferren Biotech uh, ticks all the boxes because um, the raw material for our technology is uh, waste, which is generated during oil pressing from rapeseed. Rapeseed is grown all over the world, on every continent. Um, just to give you, put, you, uh, put this into perspective, 80 million tons of rapeseed is processed globally. Our model is very scalable because we want to license the technology, so we will be selling this to uh, rapeseed processors. Uh, for me, that's the definition of a unicorn. It's, for a, it's a company that solves a global problem. We are solving the global problem of lack of uh, plant proteins all over the world, and our business model and technology are scalable. I see Peter. And she's got a good smiling. price point. <laughs> <laughs> but Peter, uh, follow-up question to you because uh, you are very knowledgeable when it comes to uh, agri-food startup market on a global scale, and you mentioned those unicorns. Which specific verticals or niches they were coming from? 
where those more, uh, for example, end consumer product producers or ingredients or uh, technology companies supplying uh, certain manufacturing technologies? Well, I think uh, it connects to what, you know, Magdalena was saying. Uh, so we had a first wave, which was basically delivery, okay? Then came the novel foods, so all the, you know, the, the impossible foods and the beyond meats and so on. But those hit the wall. They hit the wall, first of all, uh, actually two walls, uh, which are kind of one against the other. You can go on quality, but if you go on quality, the price goes up, and it's not competitive to traditional products. And, and so now what we're seeing um, is a new wave of players like your company that are trying to address the industrial issue, okay, of providing ingredients, uh, especially ingredients, that enable to, you know, bring down the price and, and preserve, you know, a good food quality experience. And so we're seeing a lot of these B2B players uh, doing precision fermentation and, you know, primarily biotech um, that are, that of course have huge potential, you know, to, to scale uh, globally. And that's where I think now there is the biggest interest. But of course, also agritech. Also agritech. We're starting to see unicorns there. Um, it's you know the, the, this sector has emerged in the last ten years, uh, and so it, it will take a little bit more time to see the same number of unicorns that we've seen in other sectors. But I'm pretty hopeful that we'll see unicorns all across the value chain, from literally from you know who's producing the seeds all the way down to uh, you know, appliances in your kitchen. Maybe a question about an elephant in the room. A question that was definitely uh, not prepared by uh, any of the panelists, but something that uh, potentially disrupts and uh, endangers the fates of startups in many countries interactions with regulators, right? Peter, you mentioned the challenges of the Italian startup market with, for example, crickets or in vitro meat. We also face some potential regulatory challenges in Poland. So what's, what's your stand on this? Well, there are good regulations and bad regulations. I mean, uh, in Italy, we, there's a lot of politics, uh, of course, Italians are very traditionalists when it gets to food. So it's, you know, if you want to scare them, say that they're going to eat insects and they all freak out. So, <laughs> it, you know, up to one year ago, if you wanted to be a populist, you would talk about immigrants. Now you're talking about food. This is exactly what's happening in Italy now. Okay. Maybe something similar could happen also in Poland. I wouldn't be surprised. But the point is that this is fake stuff, okay? So, you know, building the boogeyman of synthetic meat makes no sense because in the next 10 years, it's very likely this is gonna happen, right? On the other hand, actually regulation can be very positive. We've seen some terrific startups that have emerged because regulation came in, it made some businesses, traditional businesses, unsustainable, and only thanks to these innovations that startups are bringing, they're making them economically sustainable. So actually regulation, can be a very powerful driver of innovation. It has to be smart innovation, okay? It mustn't be ridiculous, bureaucratic, excessive, uh, you know, there is that too. But for example, think of fish quotas. Fish quotas in fish aquaculture and so on. This is bringing a total new breed of innovations to produce fish in a more sustainable, healthy, uh, and so on. So, Yes, re regulation is not bad, not necessary. I would love to comment on that um, um, by presenting you our, our example. Uh, to be in the place with development of technology where we are now, uh, we gathered already almost uh, 9 million euros. Um, around 70% comes from European Union. So it means that our project and our technology is important to EU. But on the other hand, we had to apply for regulatory permits, so-called novel food ingredient status, and then we hit the wall. 
The process on average lasts two to three years. We had to submit five kilos of documentation as compared, for instance, to US, where we applied also for permits, and it was only one kilo of documentation, and much uh, faster and easier procedure. So uh, that's my reflection on that. By the way, does this mean that European consumers could be safer, more secure and more confident in the regulatory interface than the US consumers? Um, we had to provide scientific data. We provided scientific data of the same quality to both regulatory bodies. Uh, simply for uh, European Food Safety Authority asked for more documentation, uh, more files, um, so it's a more complicated procedure. Yeah, but you have to say something positive now. Uh, not the positive thing is that I, I can't believe that the regulation can block the solutions that are needed, because we know that by 2050 we won't have enough proteins to feed all the people. Yes, that's the moment when the, the growth of the human population will stop, finally. So I deeply believe that it will improve and those regulations will be securing the customers, but at the end, regulations are regulations, but the brands uh, will also have their requirements and their standards uh, to, to keep the quality yes, of those uh, solutions. Yes. So at the end, the positive thing is that uh, the more innovation we have, the more players on the innovation category we have, the better it is, that's a natural uh, uh, rule, yes, the, the more complex the ecosystem is, the better it is, then uh, there's no doubt that we have to cooperate and I wish you to become a unicorn and uh, I will do my best to support you. And uh, yeah, and I believe it will happen also in Poland, yeah. Last thing, just a few words. What do you think will be the fruit of the future? 10 seconds for each of you. Can I, can I? Rapeseed protein. <laughs> Rapeseed everywhere. Peter. Um, it's, it's really hard to say. I think, yes, proteins is certainly one, but not just proteins, fats. There's also a huge problem with fats uh, and that we have to produce in a more sustainable way. Um, what's the future? I think, I think it's, it's, it's going to be um, the, the real challenge of the future is not the food, because we're going to have some really interesting food, but it's the consumer again. Uh, getting the consumer on board uh, will require some, some effort. Jan? Uh, I know it's, it, it's not so popular because we have, uh, uh, we, we have just saw the, the TV show, The Last of Us, where mushrooms plays not, not necessarily a positive role, but I believe in mushrooms, and I believe that mushrooms will become the solution for many problems. Let's hope so. Uh, and concluding with those insightful comments, uh, my uh, warm welcome to all of people who joined our session. We are going to continue for about two more hours. Thank you to all the panelists. We are now going to switch to Polish and we'll see each other for two more debates afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.